afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Wiesman Academy web-based training series. Uh, today, we're going to look at the Vitatronic 300K series controls. Uh, these are uh, both touchscreen controls. Uh, the GW6B version uh, is specifically designed for the Vita Crosso 200 CM2 boiler. Uh, gives functionality as a single boiler or multiple boiler control. The other control we'll look at is the Vitatronic 300K MW2C, uh, and that is a touchscreen cascade control for Vitadens 200 boilers. Uh, we're going to kind of go over both controls a little bit simultaneously because there are a lot of overlapping features, but I'll try to point out as we go through what is individual. First control we look at is the GW6B. And it is a multifunction control. It is uh, available to be configured as a single boiler control. So if you had a standalone uh, CM2 boiler, uh, this would be the configuration you would just, you would program it for. And it can do everything that the standard traditional boiler Wiesman boiler controls can do. It can do auto reset, uh, up to three heating circuits, domestic hot water, external demand, building automation interface, all those things. Uh, the next version or next configuration of that control is as a cascade plus master. Uh, what that means is it's a cascade control mounted on the boiler, but it is also the boiler control for that boiler. Now, as a cascade control configuration, it can look after the boiler that it's on plus seven additional boilers, so eight boilers in the package. Uh, and again, it can do the outdoor reset, three heating circuits, DHW, external demand, etc., uh, as it's required to. Now, if you have a Boiler set as a cascade master, obviously we need some slaves to uh, configure so we can have the multiple boilers. So the same control can also be configured as a slave, and that means it's a slave to the cascade master control. Uh, now that would be on all of the additional boilers in that multiple boiler group for CM2, and every boiler would have a, the same control on it, but we would program the first one as a cascade master and all the additional boilers as a slave. Uh, and then they would all be part of that package. And then these, the master boiler then operates the, pa the, the plant and the slave boilers then follow the lead of that master control. The MW2C control is a dedicated master control. So it is only a cascade control. It doesn't have any direct boiler control because obviously there's not a boiler connected to it. Uh, but as you can see here, it uh, attaches to the, um, the, uh, the manifold or it can be mounted on the, on the wall. And you can see that um, we have uh, ability to do multiple boilers again. Uh, and there you see the cascade you can be mounted here and up to eight individual boilers in the group. So this is a, a very flexible system using the same touch control interface that the CM2 does through the GW6B. Um, but it, again, it's just a cascade control. It doesn't have the need to be all those other configurations. So. In either case, both controls have a very intuitive startup wizard. This makes setting the control up from scratch very easy. Uh, we end up with, as soon as you boot up the control, it's going to go to this startup wizard screen. And the startup wizard screen gives you various options. Uh, in the GW6B control, it gives you the option of application. And that is where we would set the you know, cascade master slave or single boiler control. Uh, so that's how you would set that there. With the MW2C because it's just a cascade control. It doesn't have the option of the application because it's only ever a cascade control. The VDDNS boilers have their own onboard control, so they, they look after themselves. Um, in the wizard, the first thing you get is the language setup. When you click language, you, put, you just touch the screen over the, le over the word uh, language or over, anywhere over that bar. You get the next drop down screen which gives you options of several different languages. Uh, we now have in our controls in North America, uh, North American English and French Canadian French. Both of those have been uh, written for our culture here in Canada and in the US. Uh, so the, the, the nomenclature, the terms we use, uh, just as an example, in the Great Britain version of the English that's in this control, they'll call a hot water tank a cylinder. Where in Canada, we call it a tank, so it'll be listed as a tank and then several different terminologies that are actually just specific to North America is different than uh, Europe. So you pick the language and then you push the OK button on the screen and then you get into the next, takes you back to this screen here with, a, with the next menu for time and date. Uh, you can then touch the time and date and you have the option to set both the time and the date to set up the control. 
Uh, then the measuring units, this is uh, whether the system is Fahrenheit or Celsius or essentially a metric or imperial. So if you pick metric, you get temperature in Celsius and you get the energy values in kilowatts. If you pick imperial, you get the energy values in BTUs and the temperatures in Fahrenheit. For the GW6B, remember this is a multifunction control. So what we have now is that we have the application. So the selections are single boiler, cascade plus master and lag, like I had talked about before, or slave boiler. And this is the, uh, you would just pick this. What happens then is the control then restarts in that configuration. After you've got to this point in all the controls, uh, you're going to get this screen. It's going to reboot in the in the mode that you've asked it to, or the, in the case of the MW2C, it's going to reboot the control. And this is the screen that's going to come up next. This screen is asking you whether you want to do any further configurations in this control of the basic configurations. And I would say most of the time you're going to say yes, because that's going to take you to the coding one levels. Uh, if Especially if you're setting it as a cascade control, the important things to set are the number of boilers and things like that. Uh, so all of those things are, are in that. If you select no, basically the control takes you back to the home screen of whatever configuration you've set up for. And uh, you can actually go back and set anything in coding one or two later, but it's just easier to pick yes at this point. And then it takes you to the coding one level parameters. Like I said, after you've configured the control, all of these things that you've changed so far, with the exception of the application type on the, on the GW6B, uh, can be done later on in one of the submenus. So you go into the menu drop down and you go into the settings button and you can go back and set time and date and language and, and uh, all those parameters you can set manually later. This makes it uh, easy for uh, somebody later on to, to change the configuration without having to reboot the whole thing. As an example, uh, maybe your customer prefers a specific language and you work in a different language, uh, you can switch it temporarily while you're there and then switch it back for him later as you, before you head out. So it's a very simple way to get back to those things. Once you've done that, if you do pick out of that option to reset or to do a, a startup out of that menu drop down, you're going to get this screen. This screen is basically warning you that if you go farther than this, you were going to reboot the control back to the factory commissioning position. Uh, and all of the, and it basically what we do is it starts over with the wizard again. So you don't want to do this unless for some reason you figure that you need to reboot the control back to the factory conditions. Somebody's been in there messing around and it's, and it's uh, totally different than what it should be. Uh, sometimes it's easier just to reboot and start again. But normally you wouldn't have to go this far back into the thing. So you, it, it warns you so that you uh, know that, um, you know, maybe I don't want to do that. If you get that screen and you don't want to do that, that's what the return key here is for. You hit the return, it'll take you back to the previous screen. So let's look at the single boiler mode for the uh, GW6B. Uh, again, this is only for CM2, uh, and it is a, a mode where if you only had a single boiler in the boiler plant and you needed to control that single boiler, you would have this control mounted on the boiler, and this would be the control configuration you would want to use. This is your home screen. So what you see on the home screen is basically the same type of information you see on VitaDens or any of our other VitaTronic series controls currently. Uh, the difference is this is color and this is a touch screen. So they, you, you, instead of having a keyboard uh, to move the menus around, you just touch the screen where you want to go. So you see on the top right is your current time and date. To the left of that, we see the current energy or the current heating circuit we're, we're looking at, whether it's heating circuit one, two, or three. And if you only have heating circuit one, it'll only give you that option. But if you have two or three heating circuits, uh, you can get to the other heating circuits and it tells you which one uh, you're looking at here. Then you see the outdoor temperature, you see the boiler water temperature, and you see the little question mark. Uh, anytime you see a question mark in any of these controls, this is a help uh, menu. It's a text or a context sensitive health menu. So what you have is if you're not sure what's going on on the screen you're looking at, if you hit the help menu, it will give you information on the data from the screen you're looking at. Uh, additionally, on the home screen, we have three buttons along the left, the operating program. And again, remember, this is really relating to, everything here is relating to heating circuit one in this case, the one we're looking at. So you have the heating uh, operating program, which gives you the operation of standby uh, domestic only your heating. You have the comfort mode down below that. Um, that used to be called party mode. 
and we have the economy mode, which was eco mode, and we'll get into those in a couple of minutes as we re explain those a little bit more. Uh, but they're easily accessible from that screen for the heating circuit that's being shown on the screen. Uh, additional information that might end up on the screen that isn't always present, depending on the conditions, you might see a little snowflake. Uh, that's an indication that the outdoor temperature is cold enough that the uh, internal frost protection control logic is enabled. Uh, that prevents the boiler from getting into a freeze condition. Uh, if somebody has put the boiler in standby and it, and, and it gets cold in the, in the water in the boiler, it will start the boiler to maintain a minimum water temperature. The uh, picture of the sun is telling you that the boiler is in the daytime mode or in, in um, schedules active. It's in the, it's in the occupied mode. Uh, the reduced mode is sim symbol by the uh, moon. Again, that would be nighttime or, or an unoccupied or reduced mode uh, ma uh, position. And then you also see a little icon there on the screen for the burners on. So because the, in a single boiler mode, the boiler control looks after the burner, uh, you have a symbol for the burner, whether it's on or off. And again, back to the heating circuits at the top, all you have to do is pick, uh, just touch the screen on the top and you'll get an option of heating circuit one, two, or three if those are present in this current configuration you've set up. Uh, and then the home screen then changes to the information for that heating circuit. Uh, if there's a fault, and this happens with the, uh, the cascade control as well, and you'll see over here, you'll see a note here that same functions for cascade. If you see that on the screen, I'm not gonna mention that every time we go through here. Uh, but that's an indication that this screen is also present in the cascade control in, in the cascade configurated uh, mode, okay? So the fault comes on the control, whether it's uh, some alarm or some function that has to uh, fault that comes up. Uh, this is the thing that's gonna come up on the screen here. You're gonna get this great big screen with a fault message on it. Uh, it's gonna give you uh, some information here and depending on what the fault is, it may give you some more detailed information, but you need to, confirm that or acknowledge that to get past this screen. So that's what this button here is for. It still allows you to, you, you press the close button and it acknowledges it. So it doesn't, doesn't repair the fault, it doesn't reset the fault, uh, but what it does is it clears the alarm message off the screen so that you can go about and troubleshoot the control and go on to some other things. If you have a fault, then you've already acknowledged it, you'll notice the uh, little triangle at the bottom of, the, of this home screen uh, or any of the screens that you're on, uh, that'll always be present if there's an active fault in the control. Uh, you'll also see the red flashing light on the control as well, but this gives you uh, the in visual indication on the display. So let's take a little bit closer look at the system settings, the operating program settings. Uh, so when I click that, I'm gonna get this screen. I'm gonna see an operation uh, choices here of either a standby mode, which is basically no heat, no domestic hot water, it just sits there and, and doesn't do anything. Unless the frost protection kicks in, then it will fire the, the boiler up to maintain a minimum water temperature so we don't freeze. Uh, the other option is domestic only. That would be, let's say, a, a winter or summertime mode, rather, when you don't need the heat. And you could leave the boiler in domestic only. We still do domestic functions. And heating plus domestic hot water is a wintertime mode with domestic hot water. Now, if you don't have domestic, you're still going to see heating domestic on this button. Uh, but obviously, there wouldn't be any domestic functions. If the boiler is just a heating boiler, uh, you, you put it in the heating mode in the wintertime and, and functional for heating. The next one down is the comfort mode. And again, like I said previous, that this is really replaces party mode. Uh, when you click that button, uh, you're going to get this screen. This screen is your room adjustment. So you have a uh, room adjustment temperature. You saw that on the home screen. Uh, and that is set for your normal uh, operating, daytime operation. And then the customer can turn his temperature up and down as he requires. If they actually have the VitaTrol remote control sensors into the space, it'll actually use uh, room temperatures feedback. Uh, other than that, it's a, it's a virtual reference number so that they know they can turn it up by a couple of degrees or down by a couple of degrees. And it really isn't knowing the room temperature, but it is giving them some adjustment of the system without having to understand uh, heating curves and that kind of thing. Plus or minus button here then allows you to customize that room temperature for party mode. So maybe your party is a whole bunch of people in a room, and so you're going to have a lot of BTUs from body heat. Maybe you want to turn down a couple of degrees, but you don't want to turn the heat right off like you might at night. Uh, or maybe the party is, you know, grandma and her bridge club, and they need the heat turned up. So maybe you're just going to turn it up a little bit, and you can customize party modes, room temperature. Okay, when you select that, and then you pick OK, uh, it, it enters comfort mode, and it will maintain the temperature for about eight hours if you don't make any changes to the coating. The default is eight hours. 
uh, but you can go into coding too and you can customize that as, as well if you wanted to. The next one is the uh, economy mode. Uh, this is an energy savings mode. So in the economy mode, what we get is the opposite of party mode. You get the boiler going into a nighttime or a reduced mode immediately. So even if the schedule says McGorman goes into setback at 10 o'clock at night, uh, if you put the economy button um, at 8 o'clock at night, it will enter the nighttime mode at that time. It will stay there till the next day when it comes out of setback. So again, this is the opposite of comfort mode where we're keeping it in the daytime schedule. This is an early entry into the nighttime schedule. Then you have under the menu keys, you'll have several different functions that are available. So uh, you hit the menu at the top of the screen on the, on the home screen and you'll see all these icons. And we'll look at them individually here as we go across uh, most of them. So we're gonna look at the, the heating mode when I hit heat, click heating. What I'm gonna get is a choice of the heating circuits that are available. So if you have three, you're gonna see three. If you have one, you're only gonna see the one. The, the mode then can be, you can go into each individual heating circuit and set parameters for that heating circuit. Under that heating circuit, one is in this example, we see we have the room set point temperature. This is the same thing you can do on the home screen, so you can do it from here. We have, uh, again, the same functions as that. We have the reduced room temperature. And again, this is the reduced room temperature that gives me uh, the nighttime setting. So we had talked about the daytime setting, which is uh, the default being 20 degrees and the customer can turn it up and down. Uh, your nighttime setting in a lot of con uh, wa hot water controls resets the water temperature by an arbitrary number. What we do is a little different. We adjust a room temperature by an arbitrary number that, that references, that readjusts the water temperature. So the customer has a basis on what his comfort level is in space, not some magic number that he doesn't really understand of how water temperature should be different at night. Uh, we say we can reduce the room temperature to 18 or 15. And then it, what it does is it recalculates the heating curve with the offset for that room temperature. So it's a little bit more functional for the homeowner or the, or the end user in the, in the cascade or commercial control. <clears throat> but it gives you the same functionality without having to do any math to calculate what my water temperature should be. It gives the customer, the end user, the ability to make a quick change quickly. And we have the time schedules. Every heating circuit, Domestic hot water, domestic hot water research has ability to do a time schedule. So all of them are functional the same. We'll take a look at one and we'll see how that functions. And when I click that, I'm gonna get this screen. And this screen's going to give me a choice of the days of the week that I wanna set the schedule for. So I just highlight by touching it. You see the little white box around it. And then I can edit it. So I click the edit button and I'm gonna get this screen. This screen here now will tell me that I have a schedule currently of zero to 2400, uh, 0000 and 2400 are the same time of the day. So if I didn't want any setback, that's how I would set the control. I would set up to zero to 2400. And that's by the way, the way these controls are be shipped. Um, they will be set from zero to 2400 so that if you want a schedule, you can just put one in. But if you, by default, there is no um, night setback schedule in there. So again, use the up and down arrow keys to set the starting time and the end time, and you hit the um, X if you want to disable it. So we get to the next screen, you'll see that I always set that 1630 to 2200. And if I didn't like that, I could hit the X and it would take it back to the factory default. Uh, but if I did, if that was functional, if that was okay the way I wanted it to, then I would go on and, and just you know, move on from there. Uh, I could hit it, you know, the plus to get an extra circuit or the okay down here to accept it. Notice that we have we're looking here at heating circuit or timer two for heating circuit one. And that means I can have four timers per day per heating circuit. Uh, now these are all on timers. So there's, you see a, a grayed out one or a, a dimmed one. Uh, that is timer one. And then we have timer two in it. And whatever one is the brightest one is the one I'm using right now or the one I'm adjusting. And this is any other timers that might be in place. So again, I hit okay. In this case here, we have two timers. And what I see is on the screen, I see those two timers. I got the first one here and the one we just made an adjustment to the second one here. And I can see the rest of the days a week are still in zero to 2400 because I haven't made any adjustments to them. Now, some of the, in the um, uh, previous generations of controls, we had to go into each individual day and set it individually if I didn't want all the days to be the same. Uh, what we've done in this control made it a little easier for you to make multiples of the same and not necessarily sequential. Uh, so in that case here, again, I highlight timer one or on Monday in this case for timer one, and I click copy. When I click copy, 
I have a choice now of picking whatever days of the week I want it to copy to. So in this case here, I'm copying Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm taking the Monday schedule and copying them into that. So now I've highlighted those four days and I hit OK. And you can see what happens in the screen is it duplicates and covers all of the schedules together uh, into the same package for every day for those four days of the week, five days of the week. Uh, and that's an easy way to make multiples of the same. And you could do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever the, your schedule is, you can copy and paste individually. So it makes it nice and easy. Holiday program is another type of timer. So we have the comfort mode, which took it into daytime, kept it in daytime once the timer for nighttime was supposed to kick in. We had the economy mode, which put it in a night's back and set back right away. And those are both one time overrides on my daily schedule, so I don't have to make a change to my daily schedule. Then we saw the daily schedule, so I can put the schedule in and I can maintain that uh, schedule. I can change it as I want, but it will happen every day the same as I programmed it. Holiday schedule is a little different in that what it does is a calendar date. So if I change my mind or if I decide I'm going to go on vacation, I can set in my uh, vacation start date and my vacation end date. And basically what happens is it overrides the daily schedule for that calendar period and keeps the boiler and set back 24 hours a day during that calendar period. Just to note that it starts on midnight or 0000. 000, 000 on the day you start and comes out at 0000 on the day you come back. So if you were planning on still being in the building here, you might wanna put the 2nd of January rather than the 1st of January in this case, if you were planning on still being occupied in the building till noon or whatever your, your, your trip started. So again, this could be uh, just a one-time calendar override of the daily schedule. Then we have the heating curve. And this is where this all of our Wiesman controls really highlight, really shine. Uh, we have very flexible, very powerful heating curve control. So you take a look at what we have here on the left here. This is the chart you see in the book. And just to give a little explanation, you see the numbers going up the side here. As the number gets bigger, you can see the, uh, the slope gets steeper. Uh, we have water temperature here, and we have outdoor temperature here. So basically to set this control up, I need to know where my design temperature is, the coldest day I expect heat. And we need to know what temperature I need on that design day. And I just go across this line until that meets my design day. And that would be the curve, let's say, that I would pick. In this case here, the control is set for curve 1.5 or slope 1.5 and shift 0. And then what happens now is this gives me a single line graph of that. So rather than seeing this entire chart, I'm allowed or I'm able to see uh, the individual line that I pick. So I can make adjustments. Now, the two parameters, slope and shift are different. So let's look at the two different uh, ways they work. Slope holds onto this place. It doesn't allow this place to move. You can see that right down here. It holds onto that place. And it moves this one up and down, up and down as I pick different numbers. Uh, what we see here is one number. So if I make adjustment to this heating curve or the slope portion of the heating curve here, I will see that this number doesn't change. The 20 outdoor and the 20 water temperature is an example on this point, doesn't change but I would see the 79 or the 35 or whatever go up as I get to our cooler outdoor temperature. So it creates a uh, steeper slope. Um, the other parameter shift is a little different. So what it does is it grabs both this end and that end and moves it up or down by the shift. So it'd be like grabbing the chart here and pushing it up or pushing it down. But whatever change I made here, I also make here. And this allows me to make the, uh, the steepness and the um, starting point, ending point customized. So what I need to know when I set the heating curves, I need to know what water temperature I need on the first day I need heat, what water temperature I need on the coldest day I'm expected to see, and I adjust my slope on my shift to get those numbers. And those are gonna vary depending on what facility you're in. Uh, I tell when we do the controls training, uh, I tell uh, the students they need to know three things to set a heating curve. They need to know the type of radiators, Okay, are they radiant floor, copper fin, et cetera, like that. They need to know the building construction because the tightness or the energy um, savings of the building, whether it's a loose old building that loses heat quickly or a brand new building with high, high efficiency insulation, that's going to make a difference to you know, things like my starting point, my finishing point. The other thing is going to be the people who are going to occupy the building. Uh, if my building is, an, is a nursing home there, obviously you're going to need more heat than if it's a fitness club. And so we, there's three parameters you need to know to set the heating curve correctly. And then we give you two parameters inside the heating curve to customize 
the start point and the end point. And the graph on here makes it simple because it's a really simple, you're looking at the one line you're looking at rather than this whole chart. And again, all these numbers will change as you change those values. So let's look at DHW on the GW6B controller. Again, this is uh, very similar on the, on the MW2C control, uh, but you have a mode here for domestic hot water. And inside that you have the set point. So I click the set point. I can now set the temperature of my DHW tank and we'll have, uh, have a tank sensor in the tank measuring the water temperature and this will determine whether it needs to make hot water based on your set point. The next one is the DHW time program and the DHW research time program. Both of these are identical functions to the heating timer, although by default, you're gonna see a, a difference. So again, you would pick which heating circuit you wanted that domestic hot water to apply to because you can actually set a different DHW timer for each heating circuit. In a multi-zone building, maybe that's what you want. You wanna make sure that whenever it's occupied, we have people there, or whenever we have people there, we have the domestic on but maybe the heating cycles are three different timers. So we can pick whichever, however we want to do that. We, by default, they're going to be automatic. The uh, domestic hot water and the domestic hot water research are going to function automatically following the heating schedule, but starting a half an hour earlier. So when they start a half an hour earlier, that means what we're doing is we're topping up the temperature, any losses in the tank overnight before it actually has to go about and heat the building. Uh, if I want a separate domestic schedule, maybe I have a radiant floor heating system and I don't have a heating schedule. And I maybe want to shut the domestic production off in the evening or at night when there's nobody in the building uh, or the domestic hot water research. So then I, what I do is I click individual. And once I click individual, then I have the option of all of the same timers that I had with the heating. Uh, I don't have to program this. I'm going to leave it in automatic. Like I said, it follows the heating schedule. But if I want a customized timer, then I have exactly the same options for each of those two timers as I did with the my heating circuit. So the same function for days and copy and all that kind of thing. Under the information button, we get some basic information we can read and, and see, so we don't have to drill down really deep to find information going on. And uh, it'll be slightly different on the Cascade, only control the MW2C than it will be on the GW6B, and that's because we'll have uh, functionality for boiler in the GW6B, and we'll be able to see other, we'll still be able to see information on all the boilers through the Cascade mode, but the information will be customized to what that control is doing. So, but it gives you basic information. Anytime you see an arrow like this, that means there's further details and you click that over and it'll give you the next page down for that information. One of the things that the contractor can do is he can set some contact information. So in that information screen, you can put your company name and your location, your phone number, whatever you need to put in there. And that'll basically give the billing owner, the operator, the homeowner, whoever it is, uh, the ability to push that button and see your contact information. So it's kind of like a software business card. Uh, you can stick it in the control, and then if you, your customer needs to get a hold of you for service or, or some uh, something like that, uh, they can push that, call that information up from the information screen. Under settings, again, we looked at this a little earlier. You can go back and do time and date and that kind of thing. So that's basically the functions you have in here. You have the time and date and language, but you also have the ability to adjust the screen brightness and contrast. So you just basically choose those options and it'll give you a, uh, just like the temperature, it gives you a plus and a minus to set the screen. And what happens is the screen will actually reflect uh, what you're trying to change. So you don't have to guess at it. You can see what your result is while you're doing it. Well, after that, we have, uh, again, measuring units we looked at. Uh, factory settings takes it back to factory default for things like things like change like names and stuff. Uh, but I can name the heating circuit. So in the naming the heating circuit, I have, okay, three heating circuits. I have, again, HC1, HC2, HC3, and their long names are heating circuit one, heating circuit two, and heating circuit three. But if I want to make it a little more user-friendly to the, to the end user, I can say, well, heating circuit one is the main floor radiators, so I can actually go in and set it as main floor radiators, and I can customize the name. Under the service functions, we get another level of control. So this is uh, going to be a password-protected level. This is something that the contractor would need to get to, to set coding and to uh, do diagnostic tests and things like that. But the normal end user doesn't need to access this level. So this gives us an ability to actually access a level uh, with a password protection. So the password for the uh, service level is VI service, all small letters. And you can just punch that into the keyboard and hit OK. And then you're going to get to the service level. So under the service level, we see 
diagnosis, actuator test, system configuration, factory, or sorry, fault history, service functions, uh, startup. Again, this is going to take me back. It's going to ask me that question say, do you really want to do this? Because that's going to reboot the control back to factory. Uh, you can change the passwords, although we really don't recommend you do that a lot yeah, because if you change the password, uh, you have to remember that password. If you forget the password, uh, it's it, the only way VSC can help you is to do a master reset of the control and you're going to lose everything. It's going to even take it back to German. So this is uh, normally you wouldn't change the password, but there are functions so you can change the passwords. And if you have the service level password access or the coding two level password access, you can change different passwords. And then close just takes you out of the service mode. So let's take a look at some of these functions here. So under diagnostics or diagnosis, um, we can do more than we can do with the information level. Uh, so under diagnosis, uh, I can see a boiler set point as well as the water temperature uh, where information, I only saw the boiler water temperature. So there are further things that we can do in here to do testing. So these are the subgroups underneath that. So you have general, domestic, heating, and you can actually go and see various information in there. Uh, brief scans is a little different in that it's a it's a mode where uh, it gives you a snapshot of the whole control on a on a screen and it's either um, a numerical based or a numerical text table and uh, I personally don't use this a lot but it's uh, it's it is a good tool function tool uh, I know if tech support um, if you call tech support they will probably go here because it gives them a quick snapshot of what's going on inside the control and they don't have to do a little hunting to see if the if the lawn's configured and things like that they can see it all on the screen as well as software revisions and things like that but again I, I, it's not it doesn't have a lot of day-to-day -day functions because to make the inf information you have to read back to the manual see what configuration numbers are actuator test that's the next level we have and the actuator test is a really neat service tool uh, whether you're commissioning the boiler or whether you're actually um, trying to diagnose a, tr a problem, this allows you to drive outputs one at a time. So in this case here, I'm looking at the GW6B control, so I have burner information. So I can turn the burner on and modulate it up and down, <clears throat> but I can also turn pumps on. I can open up and close mixing valves. All of these functions, then I can do one at a time. I don't have to you know, trick the control into a call for heat or into a change in temperature in a heating circuit. And what it does is it drives those outputs one at a time. Uh, one of the uh, handy tools for this is that, okay, well, and it's a brand new installation and you're not the electrician that wired it. You're just the guy commissioning the boiler. So you want to know whether everything's wired correctly. So you go into, let's say, the boiler pump the, and you turn the boiler pump on, this, or in this case here we see on the screen, the solar pump. Uh, we turn that pump on and that pump will start, but nothing else will, will operate. So I can go to that pump and check the power or rotation or whatever on that pump and make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And I can go to the next pump or I can go to a mixing valve and open and close it. And I can verify the functionality of the system without having to, to, to play with the control and get a, a call for heat or something like that would make that pump start or mixing valve move. So again, it's a good diagnostic tool for troubleshooting. Uh, you might say, well, that pump I think should be running. So you can go there and see, does it actually have a physical connection? Is it actually able to run? And I can do that. And then I can go back and troubleshoot other things if it isn't running. Under system configuration, this is going to be coding level. So we already have access to coding one by hitting the service, by putting the service pin in. But we can also now access uh, coding level two. Uh, that would require an additional password. So if I go to coding level one, I see the basic information here and all the, are all broken into subgroups. So general domestic hot water service, I mean, the, cat, uh, the MW2C is not going to have this menu, but you'll see most of the rest of them in here. And that'll be, you know, based on what you have uh, connected to your system. And you can then go to the coding for those levels. And in the service manuals, the coding is organized in the same group. So if you're going to go to domestic hot water, you go to the domestic hot water coding section of the book, and then you just have to look after the coding in that section. So you don't have to read all the codes. Uh, now, you, if you want to see all the codes, you can do that right here. So you hit all codes, and basically it packages all of the codes that are in here into a numerical order. So you see them all from start to finish. And again, our tech support people uh, like to do it that way. They're very familiar with the coding inside the control. So uh, they will probably ask you to go here and, and to do coding because they, they'll know where they're going and what they're doing. But this makes it simpler for um, if you're just doing a specific code, you just go to specific areas. And reset means exactly that. It resets all the coding addresses in that group, in this case, coding level one. Uh, back to the factory default. So uh, it doesn't reset the whole control like the master reset does or like restart the wizard does, but it does reset that coding level. So when you go into one of those uh, groups, you'll see in this case here, we're in the general level. 
we see this is address 00, and the current option is 2. Now, 00 is one of those really neat addresses that sets itself. Uh, so you don't really have to worry too much about address 00 unless you take out a piece of hardware that you had hooked up before. And then it's going to always tell you that, hey, I should see this, and I don't, so it's going to give you a fault, so you'd have to go in here and reset it. But other than that, 00 address is going to set itself. And then there's a little description now in the coding levels to tell you what that is. So we can see that. This is one heating circuit, a one without a mixing valve, but with domestic hot water uh, connected as well. And that's what that function is. So, and, but all the coding is the same. You'll have the address here, and you'll have the variable that you, you can adjust the address here, and you need to go to the, the coding book to determine what those changes you want to make are. So coding level two is very similar. The difference is that coding level one has a limited number of addresses, and coding level two has all of the coding in the control. So I typically, or again, in, in the controls training, I tell the students that if you're going to do coding in the control, do it in coding level two, because there's nothing in coding, coding one that isn't also in coding two. So everything is in coding two. And it's just that way you can go through the control and make sure you didn't miss it and you wanted to change. There are a lot of codes in there, and most of them you won't need to change. Uh, but there's a lot of power behind this control, so the functionality is there. To get to that coding level two, as soon as you click that button, you're going to get a new password level. So the new password level for coding two is VI Expert. And that, again, is a password that's in the control. Uh, again, you could change that if you want, but again, we don't recommend you do that too much. This way, their password's in the control the way it's shipped from the factory, and it's easy for tech support to help to get you that number back if you forget. This is, um, again, once you've entered VI Expert, you're going to get the similar method. You're going to get the similar functionality in the, in the windows that you're going to get. Again, all the coding address gives you all the codes in coding two, which includes the codes in coding one, like I said, and reset resets coding two. So it's the same functionality as coding one. Then we get into fault history. Again, under the service menu, I have the ability to do fault history. And the fault history then will give me a list of all of the faults that have happened in this control since the last time somebody reset it. So uh, it gives you a timestamp and it gives you the fault information. Uh, again, sometimes there'll be a little bit more information. You hit the question mark, it gives you a little more detail. But depending on the fault, it'll tell you that there's, a, say, it's an outdoor sensor fault or something like that if there's more detail available on that fault. Uh, but they're all going to be in a list here. And those not necessarily faults that are currently happening in the control room, not necessarily problems in the control right now. What those are, those are historical faults. So those are things that have happened in the past. So again, I always recommend in the controls course that they you practice good housekeeping. And when you're working on the border, when you're all done, before you head out and jump back in your truck and head on to the next job or home or wherever you're going, uh, you go into the fault history and reset the fault history. And you can do that by hitting the reset button in the, in the fault history. That clears all of the faults that are in there. So the only faults that will pop back in will be anything that you didn't fix or anything that's currently a fault. But all the faults that were previous are gone. Now, what that does is that means that the next time somebody, you or another technician shows up at this boiler, anything in this list is new since the last time the boiler was looked at or since you left a working boiler. Uh, so it's a good, just a good housekeeping to clear the fault history. Uh, service functions. Then we get into some uh, other functionality like the lawn participant check. Lawn participant check is something we have to do every time we add or remove a lawn participant. Now, lawn is a communication protocol. So it, when the, the Wiesman boiler, the Wiesman control has to talk to, the, say, the Cascade or another boiler, or if it has to talk to the building automation system or anything like that, we use lawn as our base for communication. To understand lawn is different from other building automation systems like BACnet or something like that, it's just basically a different language. So you have Mac and you have PC. It's the same thing. You have Lawn and BACnet. They're just different ways of doing things. And we partnered with uh, Lawn to do the using their, the software with the, that they write uh, for communication. So that's what we have Lawn. Now, Lawn requires that everybody has their own address. So if I want to get a hold of you at, at your house, I have to know your phone number. Uh, this is the same thing. If the well, one control needs to talk to another control, it needs to know where to find it, it needs to know its location. So everybody has a lawn participant number, and they're all different in the system. Any given system, they're all different. The cascade will have one. The boilers will have one. The mixing valve controls will have one, et cetera. Um, now, that means now that you once you've put the lawn participants' numbers in all the devices, we have to go do a poll. So the participant check basically says, it says, hey, who's here? And every lawn device calls back and says, I'm here, I'm participant one or boiler number one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through the system. 
Uh, and you need to do a lawn participant check every time you add or remove any lawn device. So if you add in a new border or if you had to replace a lawn card for, for some reason, uh, you would need to do a participant check just so that everybody was current. Again, the startup menu takes you back to the factory wizard. So uh, again, you do that as kind of a last resort unless you intentionally want to reboot the control back to the factory and reconfigure the system. And again, it's going to give you the warning uh, so that you don't accidentally do that. Close the service level. This is an immediate close of the service level. So if you don't push any buttons for half an hour, roughly, uh, it'll drop you out of the service level and you'll have to enter the passwords to get back in. But one of the nice things about this control is once you've entered the password, you can go back and forth through all the menus of the control. As long as you're pushing buttons, it'll stay in the service mode. But this allows you to shut the service mode off right away. So it potentially you might have a customer or something who likes to play with the buttons. So maybe you don't want them to do something you shouldn't do or accidentally change a configuration that would cause you know, a problem with this heating system. So before you get in your truck and drive away, you push the close button. Uh, and it will drop it out of service mode right away. But again, if you didn't touch it, if you're on the way out the driveway and you go, oh, I forgot to do that, after half an hour, it's going to turn itself out of the service mode anyway. And you'll get a prompt and make sure that that's what you want to do. Again, it say, do you want to end the service? And you say yes or okay. So in the slave mode, okay, this is a single boiler we looked at and we looked at the configuration of all the schedules and stuff, which are the same in the, in the cascaded modes. But the slave mode's a little different. In the slave mode, Again, we would pick slave from the uh, startup configuration for the GW6B control. Again, this is for Vita Crossel 200 CM2. The home screen looks different. So I see less information than I might on the single boiler of the Cascade because it doesn't have to do as much. Domestic hot water, outdoor temperature, mixing valves, uh, all the three heating circuits, they're all done through the Cascade. So all this boiler has to worry about is himself. He only has to worry about he's getting a set point and getting a command from the master control or the Cascade control. And he's going to give you information based on that. So we see the water temperature. We see how many BTUs. We see the basic information on the home screen. We see the drop-down menu to get to the sub-menus. We see that it is a lag boiler, which means it's a slave. And we see the current time and date. And it gets its time and date from the, the lawn bus from the Cascade. So you don't have to worry about uh, them being different. Uh, you would set up the, um, the Cascade when you set it. It would be defaulted as the master and system monitor and the alarm manager. And it would also send the time stamp out to the other controls. So you see under the drop down menu, you have less things, information, settings, and service. Because we don't have to do domestic hot water and outdoor reset and heating circuits, that's all done by the Cascade. So there's fewer menus to, to deal with. Now when we get into Cascade and master mode. This is where the GW6B and the MW2C are basically identical in their function. Um, so the only difference is in the wizard. Again, in the GW6B, I have the option of application. But because the MW2C control is just a cascade, that's, that's its only function. Uh, it doesn't have to be a boiler control because it's for Vita N's 200 boilers, and they already have their own boiler control. This then doesn't have the function uh, for that application. But other than that, the wizard is going to be the same. Once we do the wizard, then we get to the home screen. And the home screen gives us information on what's going on. So I have all the boilers in my system. I show what temperatures. I again have the drop down menu. I can see that I'm the cascade. I can see my time and date uh, information. Uh, and then I have the arrow key in this case here because what happens is I have more than five boilers and they won't all fit on the screen. So the arrow key just gets me to the next group of boilers. And you can see there's the information we see. Basically we have menu, we have the common uh, supply temperature and we have the common supply set point. So what the cascade is asking all the boilers to produce for hot water, this is the low loss header sensor. And this is the set point that is trying to achieve at the low loss header. So in the number of boilers that are on uh, and what their function are, are all individually shown on the screen. So let's take a little closer look at that. I have the boiler number two here, which I can see is running. I have the white line up here tells me that it's running. I can see the burner is on. I can see the white dot here. That tells me that the cascade is using this boiler. He's running because the cascade is telling him to run. And I can see how many BTUs, in this case, this control is set for BTUs. So see how many BTUs uh, are running on this boiler currently. Uh, number three boiler is available. He has a gray dot. That means he's ready to go, but the cascade doesn't currently need him. He, there's no call for heat requiring boiler number three to be on. So I can see I don't have any burner on, and I see I have zero BTU output. Boiler four over here is offline for some reason. He has an X room. That means that the cascade can't use him. 
He might have his power turned off. He might be in a fault or an alarm mode. Uh, somebody might be have him in the service mode. They might be in the service functions of the control uh, doing a relay test or something like that. So the cascade can't use him. So again, we have an X, no burner showing, no output showing. If this happened to be the lead boiler, then this control would automatically pop the next one in the lead position. It wouldn't have to wait a time frame or uh, wait for temperature to drop. As soon as he goes offline and he can't be used, the next boiler is going to be configured as the, as the mask during that time period. You can rotate the lead boiler. So the lead boiler doesn't have to be the boiler with the cascade on it. It could be any one of the up to eight boilers in the system. And you can do it manually from this screen. And so in this case here, we see boiler number eight is my lead. And one, two, three, four, et cetera, are the lag boilers in that order. You can see these boilers again are off because they're offline because of the X's. And if there's more than four boilers, I, I can see more boilers. But by hitting the arrow here, I can change the lead boiler. In this case here, eight is the lead boiler. You can do this manually like at this screen, or you can do it automatically through coding. And in coding, you have two choices, either by first day of the month or by so many hours on the lead boiler, which you have a, a choice of picking how many hours on the lead boiler to set the rotation. Uh, but you can also do it manually. A lot of guys are just doing it manually. So every fall when they turn the boiler on, they just go into the screen and change the lead boiler. And then that's the lead boiler this year. And you know maybe every, if they want to do it more often than that, they do it in January 2 or something like that again. And they can just do it manually. Or you can do it, again, automatically through the other screen. So we take all of these boilers together. And in the case of the GW6B for Vita Crossa 200, we have a Cascade Master. We have all the slaves. They can all be input through a long communication cable to a gateway. And the gateway is the interface to make it talk to the building automation system. So this is a translator. So uh, I'm going to take all the points I want to know out of here, and they're all going to be going into this box. But the billing automation system, he might only want to know, you know 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 points out of the hundreds that are available on this controllers. So all I have to do is ask for those specific points. And even if this is one of these other protocols, and we talk about lawn, that's what our border controls are used as lawn, but let's say the building is a backnet building or a mod bus building or an open therm building. We can, through the gateway, translate lawn to backnet as an example. So then all the information in lawn gets translated to backnet. So it's like uh, if I speak English and you speak Chinese, we can uh, we need a translator or we're not going to be able to communicate very well. This is the translator. Okay. So that's for the cascaded control. What we have in the same kind of configuration for the Vita Dens 200, but with the cascade. So. Again, the cascade control be connected to the gateway, and then all of the boilers in the cascade can send information through the gateway to the billing automation system. And if it happens to be a different protocol, then they can certainly translate that. The gateway then translates that information. Uh, so you can see lots of functionality, but whether it's a multiple Vita Dense group or a multiple CA, Vita Cross 200 CM2 group, and this can be done on a single boiler too. If you only had one boiler, you, know, you can also put a gateway on it and it can talk directly to that system. The other thing we can do here, which we not gonna address today, but we ha had a webinar last week on that, was the uh, Vitacom LAN 1. So you can also send the information from all of these devices to the Vitacom LAN 1 through the LAN card. And that allows you to use the app that we have for the phone or, the, or your tablet to access information remotely too. And if you weren't able to sit in on that webinar, uh, we will be posting that webinar on the website very shortly, and you'll be able to get to that information. Now I have a question on the screen here. Can you change coding through a gateway? You can't change the boiler code or the control coding. You can't go in and say coding to and change it from the gateway. There are some things you can change from the gateway, um, but if you were to map all of the coding addresses, you probably wouldn't want a gateway that expensive because the more points you have, the more the more the, the expensive they are. And normally you don't want to do coding remotely. You want to do coding when you're in the vicinity of the border so you can verify what's going on and see it physically. So you can read and write points through the gateway and there are some coding addresses that would be available through the gateway, but it's not something you would normally do. You would want to maintain that integrity while you're physically in the plant because you, you could make a mistake and you could change something which would change the functionality operation of the boiler. And you might not see that on the gateway uh, because it, it sees information happening in the system, but you'd be able to see uh, while you're standing in front of the boiler that something was wrong. So it's, it's probably not something we want to do. 
Uh, that's the only question I have up. So I uh, want to thank you for attending the webinar. And uh, again, we're, if you have need for information, you can get a hold of me at uh, phone me or you can email me. But if you do have a question you need help with on a controller or a boiler or any of our equipment, certainly call the 888 number you see there on the screen. That's our tech support hotline. Uh, we have a dedicated tech support number, with dedicated receptionist for tech support. They can log your call in and, and get your service help. We have a team full of people in both Canada and the U.S. that do tech support for North America. And you'll get the, the help right away. And, and uh, they're very well versed on the controls and, and on the boilers and the burners and things like that that we're using. So uh, certainly give them a call. Again, uh, thanks for uh, coming to the webinar today and taking the time out of your day. And I hope you uh, enjoyed it. And again, look out for more coming down the line. Again, thanks for coming.